Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that brings behavioral science to life. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We dig into the research and the applications of behavioral science that will improve your well-being, your relationships, and your organization by helping you find your groove. We've published more than 360, 360 episodes. Wow. And we thought that you might want to know a little bit about the community of Groovers that you are a part of. Did you know? Did you know that tens of thousands of you listen each week in more than 170 countries and that only about half of you live in the United States of America? That's kind of cool. And if you are listening in the United States of America, you're most likely to, say, live in New York. Forget about it. Uh, or California. Very cool, dude. <laughs> or North Carolina. Y'all enjoying this podcast? <laughs> uh, or Minnesota. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the, the other half of you that live outside of these United States of America are most likely to listen from the UK. Oi, listen up. Germany. Ah, zu hören tut gut. <laughs> Australia. Good on you, mate. And Canada. Hey, uh, why does it feel like Minnesota and Canada sound like the same thing? Well, Canada <laughs> is just Minnesota North or Minnesota's Canada <laughs> South. They're, they're basically almost the same thing. Okay, I, I guess you're right. Okay, but as a groover, you're slightly, just slightly more likely to be male than female, and you're probably pretty well educated. And, and you have great tastes in podcasts. Uh <laughs> We don't have any stats on that. Oh, but they're groovers. They, of course, have great taste in podcasts. Uh, of course. Of course. Okay. So we also know that you like listening to smart guests, and this episode is no exception for that. I thought this little discussion was appropriate because our guest is born and raised in the Netherlands, went to college in the UK, where we first caught up with her, and now works in Australia. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, it is woe, isn't it? Merle Vandenacker is the Behavioral Science Manager at Commonwealth Bank of Australia, or CBA as it's known locally. Her undergraduate degree is in liberal arts, and she did her PhD in behavioral and economic science at the Warwick Business School. Now, we first met Merle when she was doing her PhD work because she started a blog based on interviews with luminaries in our field. The blog was called Money on the Mind, and we have links to it in the show notes. We urge you to check it out. Yes, please do. We started our conversation with Merle a bunch of years ago while she was in grad school, and we stayed in touch because of her passion for the application of behavioral science. She also wants to use this knowledge that she has to help people make better financial decisions. And we are always glad that she's doing what she's doing. Uh, she's an intellectual, tell it like it is woman. And uh, we have fun, always, always, always have fun when we connect with her. God, is, isn't that the truth? So we hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's just say that. And, and with that, Groovers, we want to encourage you to sit back with a multicultural pour of applied behavioral science spirits and enjoy our conversation with Merle Vandenacker. Merle Vandenacker, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you so much, Tim. An excellent pronunciation, I have to say. <laughs> well, we're going to refer to you. We're, we're just going to go back to the sort of Americanization of your yeah. name. For We're just going to call you Merle for the rest, if, if that's okay. 100% and most, okay. Mostly because I could never do that uh, <laughs> with the proper pronunciation in any form. So anyway. Okay, let's get started with the speed round. Quick, coffee or tea? Yeah, I see All you the have time? it right in front All of you. The right there. Oh, come on, man. I spent five <laughs> years in the UK. Come off it. <laughs> <laughs> but Australia is a coffee drinking uh, country, isn't it? Or... I've, on, I've only been there about 18 months. They haven't got me 18 yet. 18 months? That's long enough to get like ah. a white flat and some of the others and all that kind of... All you, right. mean, you mean okay. a flat white? <laughs> A oh, flat white. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> See, I'm I'm up. I'm on the other side of the world. It's backwards up here. So for sure, there for sure. you go. Um, okay, Amsterdam or Sydney? Amsterdam. Ooh, wow, that was quick. Okay, yeah, sure. that was quick. Okay, simple yes or no question here: Is behavioral science in the wild the same as it is in academia? No. Mm. 
Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to dive into that. Final, in final speed round question. Do you need to have a PhD to thrive in behavioral science? Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Woo! Why is that? So now let's let's Tim, talk you're, about you're, that. You're validated. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, Tim, just just throw down your career now, and like you know, Kurt Kurt outdoes you with a PhD. You, you need to leave this podcast, leave the field completely. Like your behavioral science card revoked. No, but this is. I think it's. I think a large chunk of it, as as often, is this academic snobbery that you need to be an academic to do good science. Those days, like no offense, but they are long gone. Uh, yeah. And it has nothing to do with there being a lot of PhDs now in business or in applied behavioral science. It's just, it's a statement that where as soon as you democratize science a lot better, which has happened over the past two-ish decades, this entire assumption that the science being done in business or in a more applied context is, is somehow a lesser, that assumption really no longer holds. I think there's plenty of applied consultancies in the UK, in the States, in Canada, in Australia, and in most countries that have a very strong behavioral tradition. Israel is also a very good example of it. Mm -hmm. that, that could wipe the floor with you know a lot of the academic work that's being done, especially because a lot of academic work can still be accused of being very ivory tower. So if, if you accuse one of being less rigorous, then you can accuse the other one of having little to no external validity. We know that for both academia and for applied behavioral science, a lot of that just doesn't hold true. So maybe it, it's time to just stop talking in extremes and just look at the great work being done all over the world. Do you think part of that comes with the added, and maybe this is the wrong way of stating this, but the, the ease of being able to access information and some of the research papers and different things that it used to be really difficult. You had to be, you had to, you know, uh, get the journals and buy them and all of that. But now it's uh, relatively simple to you know join into some service and be able to get that information or even get summaries of that information at a touch of a, of a button. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think academic publishing, obviously peer-reviewed publishing, it's, it's, it's the gold standard. Is it the be-all, end-all? Debatable at the best of times. But like the fact <laughs> that you can just... I have opinions about that. I'm entitled to them. I'm happy to I'm happy to die on that hill. You can fight me on that all day long if you want. No, I, I think I'm <laughs> agreeing with you on that hill, but uh, we'll 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 go on that later. Sure. Well, at least it's a nice comfortable hill then. Um <laughs> but yeah, I mean th this is this is the thing, right? Like academic publishing, of course it's a, it's a goal in and of itself, but a lot of academics, for example, they've got more corporate type side hustles or they work together with lots of corporations for data reasons, for implementation reasons, for funding reasons. There's plenty of reasons why you would do this. So as a result, not the academic wants an academic publication. That's the aim of the game. The company most likely wants something that fixes a problem and that works, and a happy medium that will also most likely get produced to showcase that the company does great work and is open to it, as well as the academic knows how to do applied work, is a white paper. Mm. Now, white papers are one of the most easy available things on the planet because that is what they're created for. And obviously, even academic papers these days, if you can't get them published immediately, which is a trajectory that could easily take you three years, you are both well aware, <laughs> drop it on SSRN and be done with it. At least it's in the public. SSRN is publicly available. I think the last paper I wrote, I'm pretty sure the, re the reference list is half SSRN references in their oh, working yeah. paper series. So this, like, you need to get the information somehow, and everyone is aware of that. Like, you're not gonna get cited, which is important, for papers that no one can access, and mm. it matters, and everyone knows it matters. They've just now stopped denying that it matters, which you know, half the battle. <laughs> so you couldn't easily anticipate where you were going to be when you when you were in your PhD, but but what was the impetus for getting the PhD in the first place? <laughs> the impetus for me getting a PhD was delusion, Tim. So here we are. <laughs> there we go. There it is. It's out there now. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I, have, I have freely admitted to that to, to anyone who's ever asked. So when I, I did my master's in the UK, it was my first year in, in the UK, did it in behavioral and economic science. Uh, absolutely loved it. I have nothing but positive things to say about that program uh, and about uh, the University of Warwick at large, except for the fact that it is situated in Coventry, which is a shithole. Um, which I, I don't recommend that to anyone, but somehow I spent five years there. Anyway, back to the master's, loved it. But Warwick University has a great reputation. Yeah, it the does. University of Warwick has a, has a great reputation. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, 
according to a colleague of mine, Warwick produces the Navy SEALs of behavioral science. Wow. Oh, that's impressive. Stro so you're, strong you're a Navy opinion. SEAL. Mm. <laughs> Clearly. I mean, look at me. Navy SEAL material right here. <laughs> But yeah, sorry. So uh, I did the master's. I've always been a grade A student. And somehow, and this seems to be this thing, if you're a grade A student, very studious, loves to study, somehow you're supposed to be PhD material. It's a very strange assumption, which really doesn't hold as well as a lot of people think. So as most people at Warwick do, I went through all the career fairs. So you start your university trajectory in October. By um, mid to end of October, you've already done three different career fairs. Don't question that too hard. <laughs> wow. Just leave, leave that behind you for now. And then so you have, everyone went through the same trajectory as a lot of people fresh in university do. You go through your training and assessment centers, and then you go through your interviews with PwC and Bain and McKinsey and throw a big consultancy at it and I will have had an interview with them. Pat on the back for myself. I did get invited back. I just unfortunately hated the whole process. I hated it. There wasn't a single person there that I, I vibed with. The, the work that they described sounded awful. Not to say that they don't do interesting work. It's just for me at that stage, and bear in mind, I was 20. It just sounded awful. So by this stage, just like mid-November, I think my life is over. I've barely started the masters, but I'm convinced it's it's doom and gloom. It's the end of it all. And I go to to my my mentor, uh, who at the same time is, is teaching me R, which is a course I sucked at. <laughs> Took me wow. forever to wrap that around my uh, to wrap my head around that. And he told me, well, what is it that you actually want to do? And I was just like, well, I just want to make people better at managing their money. And he's like, well, do you know why they suck at managing money? I was like, I've got an idea, but it probably needs some more research. He's like, okay, then go do research. Go do a PhD. So by mid-December, I'd launched a whole plethora of PhD applications. I, by mid-January, I got accepted into the one at Warwick, which I actually wanted with the professor slash mentor figure that told me to get one to begin with. And, and here, uh, here I was, you know, full, full scholarship, full placement, and uh, a, more than half a year of the master to still go. And as you can tell by that story, I did absolutely no research into what a PhD would be like. <laughs> and that's where the ivory tower crumbles. <laughs> so you asked how I got there. And that story is not one I want people to replicate because it is not good. <laughs> But, you know, on the other hand, you had kind of a do-gooders disposition. You wanted to do something sure. good in the world, right? Uh, you know, and and I was always curious, actually. We, I, I'm just going back here. We met first in January of 2020, right before the pandemic hit. True. And you were in your PhD at Warwick at the time. But you had a passion for financial systems uh, that was just remarkable in, in my <laughs> mind. What... Why? What What was the catalyst? What got you there? That is a very good question. So I'm always, I've always been interested in psychology and how people think about things. To me, there's there's not that many resources in in the world that really matter thinking about for a long time, just because we've got so little time. So time is actually one of the resources I have a strong, strong interest in. Health is one of the others. Love or the capability to, to love and have social connection is is another. And then the last one is money. And when you look at these four-ish, then the reasoning about love and social connection and health and time, especially because they are, well, time and time is definitely a finite resource. The others, I, I don't think they, they are. I mean, health, if you put enough time and effort in, can be an endless resource, hopefully. But all of it somehow in this day and age tends to be second or even third or fourth place to money. The world is so overtly focused on making money, getting more money, managing your money more efficiently. There, I mean, there's people who build entire traditional careers around this, influential careers, so, so uh, social media, influencer type careers. And this is an incredibly popular topic, but the amount of misinformation on it is mm. baffling. And the fact that most systems that have been designed around managing money are very feature focused or they're they're not particularly human centric or behavior centric i find quite problematic to say the mm. least i mean if you try to pick any financial product these days 
good luck just trying to figure out something as, that should be as simple as comparing it to the next product. It's mostly impossible these days. And that, that's within the same institution. Go beyond one institution and look at the entire plethora of products out there. Also absolutely impossible to figure out which product is better. And that's not even starting at the very question, do you need this product? And is it actually going to make your life better? And these are questions which are inherently very, very complicated. That should be relatively simple, but they aren't. And then at the same time, getting a financial advisor these days is something a lot of people cannot afford. Whereas, you know, we're currently in a cost of living crisis, we will soon hit an economically defined recession. So this, this is going to be something that's going to be more and more problematic with less and less people having access to it, which actually comes back Kurt, to your point. Do you think you know, these things have become easier as more information became available? Absolutely. And there's a, there's a lot of information available in financial management. It's just a lot of it isn't particularly good. Mm, well, and, and we were talking before we um, started recording and, and you talked about how everybody just loves talking about money, particularly in Australia and different things. And I get money is like, <laughs> that's not what I said. <laughs> oh, wait, maybe I got that reversed. Maybe. But no, like, right. The, this idea that we don't talk about money, we don't talk about how we earn or how I'm investing things for the most part or the issues that I have with it. Is that part of the reason that maybe some of this is, is that a reason for this opaqueness or is that just a result of some of this? Is it, do you have any thoughts on that? No, it's, I mean, it's a chicken and egg story, right? Which it's, it's obviously the egg because of dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> but to, 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 stick, to stick with the actual analogy, it's a good question. So I'm, I'm very different from the Australians culturally because I, I am Dutch, uh, for the people who didn't know or could recognize that by my name. But the Dutch are relatively open about most things, uh, of, of which money is, is one. But if you look at countries that have more of an, of an Anglican or an English background, which the Australians uh, do, then talking about money becomes very, very difficult. And I don't really understand why that is. I don't understand the massive taboo that rests on it. But the more difficult or the more taboo you make it to talk about money, that just breeds ignorance. Mm. And ignorance is never something to aspire to. <laughs> Did you hear that, Tim? Yeah, you, wow. you shouldn't be expiring to, to ignorance. So, doggone it, I'm giving up all my dreams. <laughs> I'm sure you would have a much happier life, but I'm not sure it would be good for your financial well being. <laughs> uh, well, well said. So, what do we do about it? How do we deal with this, Merlin? It's, it's a good question. And unfortunately, every three to five years or so, we get a different meta-analysis telling us that financial literacy either does or doesn't work with heavy criticisms of the, the work done by, uh, by Lusardi, who I am a massive fan of. But it's, you know, it's, it's every three to five years, like I said, it doesn't work. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't work. Yes, it does. So like, can you build a program exclusively around financial literacy? No, probably not. <laughs> I'm not too sure the, the answer is going to come purely from technology either. So, for example, if, if you're betting on decentralized finance or whatever crypto is doing these days, I wouldn't necessarily count on that exclusively either, especially not the, at looking at the state of that currently. But it's, it's, it's a good point. But the idea with a lot of aspects in life is that it's people interacting with them, yet somehow they're not designed for people. And we are fully aware, I'm becoming increasingly more so aware of the massive amount of limitations that people are under when they make decisions or when they interact with systems or what have you. And a lot of it just isn't human-centered. Uh, as a result, I have a high hope for human-centered design or behaviorally informed design. To me, they're you know, kind of the same thing with different labels on them. But that, that is where, where I put my hope with, with a lot of highly intelligent, highly motivated people who slowly but surely can destroy the traditional system from within. Hmm. So what, what about on a more personal basis? What you've, you've done a lot of work, at least as a PhD student, you were doing a lot of work on the impact of different kinds of payment systems on uh, how people feel about money, how they react, how they manage, how they interact with their own finances. If they're using, a, for instance, a contactless you know, payment system, any tips you think on a personal finance basis that we should be think or I don't Ooh, know, that's hints. very dangerous. I cannot give personal financial advice. That's uh, that's not allowed given my my job position in in Australia. But I can tell you what the research says. 
and there there's a plethora of it out there. Obviously, Ulfa Zellemeyer, as he was supervised by by George Lowenstein, has done great work in this. Uh, George himself has done work in this, so has Dilip Soman. So if you're looking for those references, they're not difficult to find. But it, that work all starts at just simply telling people or simply studying people handling a credit card and that just going, like as soon as money is not some limited resource, which has a very clear temporal or timely deadline to it as well, all logic kind of goes out the window. I mean, we we, understand, we know how people handle a credit card. They don't handle it well. There's a reason it's all, also fallen out of favor with much younger generations. This is not a surprise to anyone involved, given how much consumer debt people have been able to rack up in older generations on, on these credit cards. But it holds true for any payment method, which is easier, which gives you constant availability to money. So there is a paper, I'm pretty sure it's done by Preledge uh, and Lewinstein, maybe, or it might be done with Semester. And it's just it's called uh, Always Leave Home Without It being very much the idea of if you leave your credit card at home, you can't spend on it. And that, that's that's great financial advice. But now we have these. So now we have <laughs> cell phones with Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, you know, insert Android Pay or insert any kind of pay on here. And no one leaves the house without their phone or their wearable, their smartwatch, whatever. So you will always have money with you. And the fact that you know that you always have money with you and that you have access to all of your resources, which you feel entitled to as they are yours, which unfortunately also includes the credit card limit, which is not yours, then people spend and they spend accordingly. Knowing that you have things available does make a difference in the decision-making process. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I talked with one woman one point where she would take her credit card, put it in a bowl of water and put it in her freezer because she was uh, kind of addicted to sell, you know, buying online and going shopping. And so she had to take it out and let it thaw for three to four hours um, before she could actually access that credit card again. And, uh, it, you know, the pieces that people have to go through because of that aspect that you're just talking about, this idea that it is free money, that the, the credit limit is my money and that there isn't necessarily a cost to it we understand, I think, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong in that thinking, but we know that there is, but, you know, my head is, I'll pay that off and it won't be a worry, right? And then I don't have to oh, pay any course. additional costs, but that's not usually how that works. So, no, not at all. I, I find it really funny. So if, if you look simply at how people approach the selection of a credit card, they are rife with optimism and they're also not looking at the right things. So, if you ask someone, and there's loads of financial institutions, whether they're traditional banks or neo banks, that do this, where they ask you a bunch of questions up front, like, how are you going to behave with this credit card? Are you going to pay off the balance in full every month? That is not a good question to ask someone because <laughs> everyone says, like, of course I will. I will of course I will. Why, why, why wouldn't I? That would be dumb for me not to do that. Exactly. So, and, but this is the thing. So keep in mind how this algorithm works on the back. If I say that, yes, I will, the algorithm or any kind of this, like, let's not pretend that this is a difficult algorithm. Now is like, okay, well, if you pay down your balance every month, then credit card interest is not something that's going to matter when you use your credit card because it's, not, it's never going to play a role because you're, you don't have an outstanding balance. So the selector tool or whatever, pro, your, whatever uh, journey or uh, customer journey you're going through will now discredit or stop weighing interest as a factor for the card, meaning that it can recommend you a really high interest card because the interest shouldn't matter to you because you've told me up front that you would not be in this position, which is you lying to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> which we're very, very good at doing. Oh, that. Tim and I oh, do that so all good. the time. All Same. the time. <laughs> Meryl, you, you brought up things that you can't talk about because of your job, but tell us a little bit about, in Sydney, you're at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Tell us just a little bit about the transition from academia to a, a corporate world. Oh, that's that's everyone's favorite question for uh, someone who left academia. They always want to know what exactly made you leave because they're looking for scandal. They're looking for hot tea. They're looking for goss. There, there is none, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> okay. oh, sorry, mate. I <laughs> should have told you this beforehand, but otherwise I was concerned I wouldn't even get invited on. So, you know, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry for misleading you, but here I am. <laughs> no, it's, um, I, I think if I was really honest with myself, I recognized in my second year that 
the way academia works for a younger researcher, or let's say an early career researcher, is not necessarily something I could do for, say, another five to 10 years, which in the current academic market is what you would be looking at. Because academia, in its current state, is a bit of a pyramid scheme. Uh, That's not to say that your old professor is trying to sell you herbal teas uh, that you then have to sell on to your friends. But I mean, maybe they are. That's, That's for them to decide. But it's, it's just very much the idea that there's, there's so many people at the bottom because they let in so many PhD students. For example, I was in a cohort of 35 PhD students for all of the Warwick Business School, and that is a lot, especially if after those four-ish years, because that's, it, I did a UK PhD, you can only really place within the business school about six of them or say one per uh, unit that we were part of, so accounting, behavioral science, finance. Uh, entrepreneurship, like these, for example. So you already go from 35 to 6. And of course, the other 29, or in this case, more likely 24, because some people do drop out from the start of the PhD, the other 24 now have to go somewhere else if they want to stay in academia. And this displacement happens throughout. So it's not Mm -hmm. just Warwick that had that problem, UCL, LSE, Oxford, Cambridge, like all of these programs are very, very similar in that there's a huge uptake at the lower levels, but then there's so, like a lot less postdocs going around and then even fewer assistant professorships. And then, you know, you keep climbing up the ladder where eventually, and I say this with, with respect to all my professors who are over uh, 60 years of age, but you need to wait for someone to retire and academics don't really retire. Right. So you need <laughs> someone to die. <laughs> <laughs> And it just got pretty morbid. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was looking at that career trajectory and I, I'd already been, and in terms of job title, I'd just been stagnant for the past four years because you're a PhD student, the end. That's what you are for the duration of your PhD. There, there is skill growth, there's knowledge growth, but there is no title change. I am comfortable in admitting to myself that, that I am ambitious. I think most people around me know that. And I didn't want to go through several more of these stages where there is little to no status growth in terms of job title. Mm -hmm. There's little to no wage growth, wages in academia, depending on the country where you are, but especially in the more junior air roles, is atrocious. Like, let's not pretend that that's going to make you rich, because it won't. And just the, 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 the hours worked for a lot of academics, absolutely ridiculous. And then just the lack of job security. And the fact that, especially in the States, the States is rife with this, that if you want to be a postdoc, you will have to move to the other side of the country for that job in like mm-hmm. a heartbeat if that's the one that you get. Now, I personally don't actually have an issue with that latter statement as I moved from the Netherlands to the UK to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It, it's, for example, if there, there are people who do want a more stable life, who have a family or who want a family, you can't uproot them every two years that you switch postdocs or assistantships or whatever. That's... Yeah. It's, it's not a healthy system in that regard. Yeah. And I, I wasn't that keen on it. Yeah. So what so advice fun. What advice would you give for those people who are in a PhD program or maybe even just a master's program or even just an undergraduate program in the behavioral sciences, right? This, this kind of area. Like what can, what kind of work can they look for outside of the academic world and and what are things that they should be thinking about in that process at least from your your perspective as a behavioral scientist oh the the world is is your oyster in that regard the the days that you could only be a, an academic behavioral scientist are are way way behind us and i find it i find it a really funny question anyway this this idea that you could become an academic behavioral scientist because if you look <laughs> at the big players in in academia they became behavioral scientists by name decades after the fact. Yeah. Because keep in mind, some of the most famous names, George Lowenstein, Colin Kama, Dan Gilbert, they aren't behavioral scientists by nope. training because right. when they were in school, that wasn't an option. Yeah. Like Dan Gilbert, famously one of my favorite, favorite interviews, has always been incredibly humble towards his own uh, past. Where he's like, I was flunking out of high school. I needed additional course credit to even stay in high school. And the only thing available at the time was psychology. So I took it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
This is one of the biggest minds currently in predominantly social psychology. Someone who was flunking out of high school who chose it with good luck. And he says himself, you know, if, if at the time cartography was the only thing available, I would have hopefully made for an excellent map maker. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I remember that from that interview. That is fantastic. And speaking of which, so that let's talk a little bit about um, Money Mind, which uh, is a blog that you started. Ages uh, ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were, you were in school when you, when you started it. Uh, first, um, tell us a little. First right? year of the PhD. And I started yeah. that as I start many endeavors in my life. Out of frustration, <laughs> yeah. which is also to answer your original question, why I left the PhD and why I didn't want to become a behavioral consultant. To actually answer your question, Kurt, you can become a behavioral consultant. You can become a behavioral researcher. You can very easily move into marketing. If you've got the work experience in it beforehand, you can very easily go into management. And every field will have a application of behavioral science. One of my closest friends currently works in conservation as a behavioral scientist. Like, Imagine that, right? It's just find a topic you're really passionate about, you're really interested in, and then look at people who are already doing it. Talk to them. I have never met any kind of people as open to talking about their own experience as behavioral scientists and just talk yourself into a job. <laughs> well, uh, again, and like both you and Tim are in finance. And so you're you're looking at that that world as well. I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you just said. It's like, find what interests you. And there is going to be a perspective that can have a behavioral science uh, approach to it. And if you really want it, you can make it and have that happen. So uh, let's let's get back to money on uh, Money Mind. And you've been collecting interviews for years now. Yep. <laughs> How many? And, and these are some of the greatest minds. I remember when you talked to George, when you got George's interview, that was that was pretty amazing. But you've had all the biggies, really. I try. Not not all of them. Some of them evade me like the plague. Mm, that's not, not a nice statement to say anymore these days. But you, you know what I'm... Mm. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll stick with it. It's 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 a good saying, just to piss poor context. But uh, no, like like I said, I started money on the mind. I think in the summer between my first and my second year of the PhD, which is the transition phase in the UK from the masters to the actual research aspect. As in, they've now told you, like, yeah, you know, I, I think you could actually hack it for another three years. Gee, thanks, guys. Um, so, but my frustration was, was first of all that I still had to do a lot of courses. I was a good student. It was fine. But I was just like, this This is not what I signed up for. And the lack of writing and the mm. lack of information dissemination, which will always come back to, I was like, I am rehashing this literature review within an inch of its own death. No one is going to read this. No one is going to benefit from this. Why am I here? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got it got existential right there. It I was got, like, I get existential very quickly. I'm only uh, at the time this goes live. I'm I'm still only 27, but I've had like four existential crises at, at the minimum. <laughs> I'm sure I've already had a midlife crisis, which doesn't you know doesn't bag good news. But but here we are. But um, no, it's it's I I get frustrated very easily because I th there are and it sounds very childish and it's probably a very young millennial attitude, but there are things that people would benefit from. There are systems in place that could be so much better. There is knowledge out there that people need to have or that they would benefit from having, and it isn't getting to them. Mm -hmm. And it just it is frustrating because you're sitting on this pile of knowledge and you're looking at it and it's staring back at you, and you're both just like, well, here we are. Like it's it's <laughs> not, you know, it doesn't do anything. And that is, that is a gripe I've had with, with academia for a long time. It is getting a lot better. That's, I, I don't want to call, I don't want to say that, uh, academia is still the ivory tower it, it used to be because it isn't, but it's, it's still slow. And it, it, it to some extent benefits from holding these systems in place. And to a large extent, it also doesn't. And uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating. And as you can tell, I don't deal with frustration for prolonged periods of time particularly <laughs> no. well. <laughs> no, not, not your strong suit. Not my no. strong suit. That that and my uh, my patience. Not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So uh, money on the mind gets uh, created. You've collected all these interviews. We understand you're turning them into a book. Eventually, yes. So <laughs> I put the emphasis on eventually. I am very busy. I, mean, I know you can't tell, but this this will took me. This will take me forever to do. 
But uh, to answer your question, I think in either August or September of this year, I'll publish interview number 200, which I have a strong feeling, given how I've currently jigged the whole thing, that that's going to be with John List, which Ooh. is one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. Nice. Not just because it's he's really great to talk to, but also because it took me three years to get that interview. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I have hunted this man down and he endlessly, and this it's to his credit and to his detriment. He has consistently told me, yes, I'll do the interview. Just send me the questions. Yes, we'll plan something in. Yes, I'll get, send you the answers this weekend. No, that's planning a call. And he's done this ping pong match with me. He's never not replied to an email. I'll have to give him that. There you but go. It was a ping pong match of three years. And he rocked up to the actual call and he was just like, here I am. And I'm like, I am going to shoot you. <laughs> it was, yeah, he's a, at least you could see the the humor in it. It's, uh... and, and John, I could see that. John is a very, I mean, it's amazing to me what he's doing. Again, he's, he's melding both yep. uh, academia work and, uh, you know, the common uh, work of just being the chief financial or economics, you know, officer yeah. of, of just a couple small little companies yeah, out there just, in the past couple, couple years. Yeah. A couple side <laughs> hustles, you know, you have to keep busy. <laughs> <laughs> who who can say that their side hustle is to be the chief economist at Walmart? Yeah, that's my side hustle. Yeah, yeah I like it. Yeah. It's, it's uh, important to have hobbies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I thought his hobbies was like collecting baseball cards or something like that. Anyway, this is asking, you know, the, the horrible, horrible question. But, you know, what of those 200 that you, you're going to have, some probably stand out and some maybe not so much. What, what are <laughs> one or two of those that stand out? One or two of those that stand out uh, for for different reasons, I guess. I think obviously there's a massive recency bias here. So I've already mentioned John List, so he doesn't count. Okay. I think if I if I try to do the opposite of of a recency effect, I think the fact that I got to interview both Dilip Soman and Colin Camera before I even published twenty interviews, I think Dilip is oh wow. was within I think the first five. Wow. Colin is within the first 20. I think George wow. is, with, is within the first 30. So by this stage, keep in mind, I'm about 21, 22. I'm in a PhD that by this stage, I've realized it's not a great personal fit for me anymore. But, but more to say as in, like, I am not known as a behavioral scientist. I don't consider myself known as a behavioral scientist these days either, to, to make that clear. But it's I've got, I don't have like a portfolio or like a network to rock up with and be like, well, you should totally do an interview with me because like all of your other buddies with like an age <laughs> index of 2000 have, <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't have the, the street cred to, to pull this off, but like it has to be said for, for Colin Kam or for George, for, for Dilip as well. They are very open people and oh, yeah. they will always make a the time. They love to talk behavioral science from very, very different angles, obviously, because the, the direction their work has taken them in has, has you know, is, they, they are still, they're all behavioral scientists, but they are worlds uh, apart. Uh, and, you know, it just get, get any of them just talking about what they're passionate about at the time, because it does change really quite rapidly. Yep. Yes, <laughs> um, it does. Then, and, you know, you, you, you have two hours of content without getting a word in yourself edgewise. But quite frankly, you don't need to. And that's, you know, so that's some of my, my favorite academic interviews. But then there's, there's great people uh, in industry as well. Obviously, Rory Sutherland, same thing. Give him three keywords and you've got seven days of content. Didn't even blink <laughs> during. He, he doesn't sleep during. It's, uh, oh and he's, he's, he's very funny. I always, I've always enjoyed talking to Rory. Does he answer the question at the end of the interview? I'm not sure. Does it matter by that stage? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> and there's there's just great people in in industry like that. I've always enjoyed talking to Jazz Broom. I think he's he's a really really interesting person in terms of how he built up Cowrie. And it's it's the same for me for uh, now Warda Malik, who's now the CEO of of BE Works, but before her it was Kelly Peters. Two absolutely amazing women, complete and utter yeah. trailblazers on how that company got built, how they do their work. I've got nothing but respect for for either of them. And it's just, you know, these are the types of interviews I really enjoy, especially as I get more and more into behavioral science, uh, sorry, applied behavioral science. As well, again, as I get more into applied behavioral science, these are the, the types of interviews I enjoy looking at people who 
had a strong interest in it, have an academic background, well, uh, you know, done the undergrad, done the masters, have something that says behavioral science or psychology or whatever on it. And then we're just like, I'm going to turn this into a company. I'm going to turn this into something profitable. And there's there's many people who go uh, on this by themselves. Elina Halona, for example, is a great example mm. of a behavioral scientist uh, currently based in the Netherlands who does this uh, as, as her, her own consultant, her own consultancy. And I find it fascinating. And they they make for amazing people to to talk to. They're they're fascinating in, in how they approach the world, how they approach behavioral science everything to aspire to but yeah so these, these I, I have favorite interviews depending on what mood i was in i suppose but <laughs> no we find you fascinating merle we have yeah. <laughs> found you fascinating from the very first time we talked to you i, I gotta tell you that um, three and a half years ago <laughs> yeah three and a half years ago so hey, tim tim's interests go last longer than like 20 seconds that's pretty good so you know <laughs> there you go yeah the the quiet applause uh, Marilla, <laughs> here's here's a, a music question for you. Do you listen to music while you work? If I code, yes. If I write, no. Mm. Yeah, so there's a difference. Okay, so if you're coding and you've got music on, do you? What kind of music do you listen to? That depends how well the coding is going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, w- wouldn't it be the other way around? Is no. it the music you listen to <laughs> depend make the coding better? No, 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 no. There's a uh, if it kind of depends. But if I'm just running some like real basic analytics, like I can listen to whatever. Uh, when in Sydney, do as the Sydney Siders do. So I've been listening to a lot of Flume lately. Who's a great artist from the Sydney area? Does a lot of really wacky EDM. I absolutely love it. If the code is not going so well and I'm losing patience and I'm losing hope, then probably some heavy metal. Um, uh-huh. uh, if the code is not going uh, well and I'm becoming increasingly angry, maybe some classical music. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's interesting. You've got some kind of a program. You've got a, a way to deal with this, all of these different situations musically. Yeah, I do. And this is also something I learned from one of my uh, my interviews. I think this was with... Uh, Oh, I'm inclined to say it was with Alex Emos, but it could actually have been with Jason Rea. And this is this is what happens if you do seven interviews in a week. You start to lose track of who yes. knows what. <laughs> no, I'm I'm inclined to say that this was with Jason. And he made the recommendation that, you know, for, for any kind of behavior that you'd like to see or for any kind of behavior that you want to, to motivate, that really, in the grand scheme of things, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again, which is why in life you should make yourself a menu. The man is also obsessed with going to restaurants, so this kind of you know works out in that regard. Where the tip is that he gave himself was very much like, listen, I know I need to work out and need to stop sitting behind a desk and a laptop all day, but I don't always feel like every single kind of working out. And there's there's people, uh, my husband, for example, like he lifts weights, he loves to lift weights. I find it one of the most boring things known to human existence. But this is the thing. Right? If the idea is just, I need to work out to get healthier, then just find yourself a range of workouts that you're comfortable with. Mm. Build yourself a menu of working out or build yourself a menu of whatever behavior it is you're trying to stimulate. And then if it's a good day, pick the most hardcore dish on the menu. And if it's not been a particularly good day, you can you can you know get off by by eating the the creamy gnocchi on on that menu you know do do do, do, do exercise light <laughs> do it like this i am going to try that you should. I, I am going to try to build myself a menu of different exercises although it'll probably be dessert heavy and i will be in trouble <laughs> so What's the dessert equivalent of an of an exercise? Just just you slowly like throwing a ball against the wall and it comes back at you? <laughs> I don't know. I have a standing desk. Stand up at the desk. There Very you good. go. <laughs> ten minutes there. Oh, I did my workout today. Uh, no, 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 right. no. Do yeah. ten minutes of squats. Then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the good thing to do. Um, if I'm going to do it or not. We don't know uh, yet. All that's, right. that's the high protein salad without dressing on your menu. <laughs> <laughs> Merle, any closing thoughts for our for our behavioral grooves listeners? Uh, you don't have to do a PhD, and if you do desperately want to do one, make sure you do your research to make sure that this is actually a good fit for you. And if <laughs> you actually don't know how to go about it, there's plenty of resources out there, including my book, The Ultimate Guide to Doing a PhD, which I hope will help a lot of people figure out whether this is for them or not. <laughs> mm, there you go. 
Merle, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's great to see you. And thanks for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. Not my first time, but a lot of people won't know that. <laughs> no, a lot of people won't know that. That's a secret. <laughs> no, well, here we are. If, if you want us to keep that a secret, you're going to have to edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Merle, have a free-flowing conversation, and groove on whatever else comes into our applied behavioral science brains. Bingo, bango, bongo, baby. <laughs> we are applied people, man. We just like applying the behavioral science. Yes, yeah. it is about applying. That's right. <laughs> Why are we on this, this like... Uh, I don't know. I don't know language uh, vernacular. I don't know. Uh, that one. All right. It's a multicultural world. Yeah. Okay. So, so Mr. Hulhan, take away from our discussion. Applied behavioral science has never been better, right? It's, it's still an emerging field. Okay. But we're 40 some years after the early papers were published. And it's still growing dramatically. But right now, applied behavioral science has never been at never been better. And I'm here to attest to that as a guy who, you know, got hired less than a year ago into, uh, you know, one of the six largest banks in the U S to lead behavioral science. Yeah. So there it is on an applied basis. Yes. So, and I think it's really interesting because again, we've talked about this before. Behavioral science is a skill set that can be applied across many different Functional right. areas within organizations are being applied, right? This idea, right. hey, it has been applied in advertising and marketing a ton, right? Sure. In product development, in user development, in user experience, in yep. HR, right? It goes hand in hand. Perfect. And that's what part of what I think our conversation highlighted too. That Yeah. Even when we break that down, even if we just to say marketing, how about like more than just or or more specific than marketing, event marketing or email marketing, or uh, there, there's applications. Marketing research. It, marketing research. There's applications, all kinds of applications in uh, in all of these. And you, you mentioned HR. How about, you know, rewards uh, with compensation with, uh, again, we could break this down into further, more s smaller categories that just makes me, just reminds me that, Anytime we're dealing with human behavior, we have the opportunity to apply behavioral science. Yes. And and what isn't human behavior? I mean, when we think about rockets, the, rock, the, <laughs> true. Okay. I'll give you that. <laughs> I was going to say, but there's, oh yeah, but they're, they're rockets themselves. But, but the designing of the rockets, human behavior goes yes. into the design of those rockets yes. in yes. the... Um, you know, flying of those rockets, there's probably a little bit of human behavior involved. All mm -hmm. of those things, right? Yes. And you, this is a piece that we talked about, right? You don't need a PhD. And that, I think, is really important. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot of people out there that are saying, oh, I'd love to be able to work in this field, but I got to go back and get my master's or get a PhD in this. And yeah. I have the belief, and I, I don't know if I think Merle said that, oh, it's the market is favoring PhDs right now. I, I would probably disagree. I think that there are a lot of opportunities for those people who don't necessarily have a PhD and or a master's in this that can be applied right away. And you can you can start working around yeah. behavioral science insights and field with without having either of those kind of um yeah credentials. Uh, let's let's say that it depends on the job that you're getting if if you're looking for a job as the head of research or decision making uh in your in the behavioral science team you probably need a phd no but maybe a master's you know, or, or a master's okay or, or just years of experience look at rory sutherland okay He's a bit of an enigma, though. Yeah, but I mean, that, he's a unicorn okay. out there. The the exception, you know, disproves the rule. So there how, you how, go. Okay, okay. Well, how about how about Sam Tatum, who grew up under Rory's tutelage at Ogilvy, and now is is actually the head of the behavioral science program yeah. at Ogilvy. 
Sam is is not a PhD right. in behavioral science. And I guess my point about there being a lot of contextual opportunities, which I think you alluded to, is that you could have a job in marketing. You could have yes. a job in HR where you're working on compensation or internal communication or rewards and not be a PhD, but still have something to say based on your knowledge and awareness of behavioral science principles. You said that wonderfully. That was spot on. I mean, that is exactly what we're trying to, to say here is that this uh, you can you can have a point of view that is informed by behavioral science that makes you better in the job that you're doing and that you can take and bring to uh, the organization and bring the insights and the benefits of that. And that is why applied behavioral science has never been better. Okay. That was that was a good diatribe. I, I like that. Um, <laughs> uh, next, I want to talk about, let's get to Merle specifically okay. and how we're both, you and I, uh, again, we just think so highly of her. She has so much energy and passion for this field of payments and payment systems. And I think she is uniquely qualified to be researching and dealing with this stuff because she grew up in the Netherlands. And why does growing up in the Netherlands make her uniquely qualified to work in this area? Culture. So she grows up in this world where a couple things are actually working in her favor to help us globally learn about debt and payment systems and things. The first is culture uh, in, in the Netherlands is, you know, people talk about going Dutch. It's a, it's an English axiom to say, oh, we're going Dutch, meaning we're going to pay, you know, our own way rather than having that awkward, how, you know, who's going to pay for what later on. And so there is this culture of financial independence in, in the Netherlands, right? And then the word debt in Dutch has a double meaning. It means both to pay off a debt or to have a debt to pay. And it means guilt. So they're like, there's this dark mm. side of debt that the culture kind of embraces and says, we don't want that. Mm. I wonder, we should have we should have asked Merle about this, right? We should have. Yeah. We, we, or we could have. We could we, have. We, we, yeah. we'll, next time we talk to her, we'll have to see. We, we'll let, actually, Merle, if you're listening, just let us know. Are we are we way off base here or are we right? Oh, Is I'm, there something Oh, I'm there? sure she'll editorialize. That's for sure. <laughs> well, the, okay. So, so here, and, and you look this up, so I'm just using the research that you you found for us here. But on average, there is a credit card debt in the U.S. of $5,500 per person. Now that's average. So obviously- Some more? A lot some people less. might, some people might have a huge, huge amount of debt and then lots of others has more. But in the Netherlands, what do you think that would be? Is it higher or is it lower given what you just said? Lower. Lower. And is it a little bit lower or significantly like 10x lower? Significantly lower. Yes, it is 410 per person, according to your math. And yeah. so when we think about that, that there is probably a little bit of cultural components in how we think and use money and debt in particular. Yeah, this $410 per person is a bit of a estimate, right? Where we looked at the 6.6 .6 billion uh, euros of debt for the country that's not mortgage-based or capital-based. Uh, and then we multiply that times uh, 1.09 to get dollars and divided that by 17 and a half million people in the Netherlands. So <laughs> just for the sake of full disclosure, it's an estimate. But that's but a good estimate. Yeah. The, the, I think the important thing is just to note the radical difference between these two countries and I think that we could, we in the U.S. and in the U.K. could see this as as a shining light of where we could go. Like we could live more financially healthy lives by uh, adopting a whole bunch of things that Merle is trying to uh, institute at CBA. Yeah, so, and I think she has some good solutions there. Right, this idea that of bringing in um, better systems, right, that understand consumer biases, weaknesses, some of the behavior yeah. sites, insights, um, and, and leverage those or take advantage of those to improve the ways that we manage our money and, and reduce the amount of debt that we have. Because I think most people would probably agree that 
credit card debt in particular probably isn't the most beneficial for most people and right. unless they're paying it off every month, which most people I don't think don't. are, right? So right. the other piece that I just want to talk, two things I want to talk about. So we talked a little bit about this, but academia, right? This idea that, hey, more people are getting higher degrees, but there is a limited number of professorships that are out there. Right. And as Merle said, that's kind of a pyramid scheme that supply outstrips demand, leading to huge yeah. wage depression for uh, those people who are are doing the professorship work, adjunct professors, the pay for the adjunct professors is wow. horrid, horrid, horrid. Pittance. Right. Just uh, and the competition for those top spots is really high. And so which leads to uh, for many people, right, this uh, idea of. The, the way to get a top professorship is to get published papers. Uh, and hmm, wonder what that incentivizes. What does that incentivize, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> Publish or perish. Publish right? or perish, right? And and this idea, uh, you know, and again, not saying that that's the the reason why there's a there's the, the so-called replication crisis or some of the fraud that has come out recently. Um, you said or, it. I or, didn't. I didn't questionable want to methods, it. but it, it could. There's, there's an incentive around getting published, and so there you go. There is. There absolutely is. And um, I dodged the question, but absolutely, the replication issues could be in part fueled by this sometimes formal, sometimes informal demand or quota system. I mean, you and I have spent enough time around uh, professors and universities to know that that at top research institutions, there is an expectation that if you're going to get tenure, you're going to have to publish a, a minimum amount. Right. And it, at non-research institutions, by the way, that's not the issue. It's, right. It's develop, it's provide good scholarship. And, and not all universities are, are those research institutions and they don't base tenure on that. And so there, there are lots of those out there as well. But I think most people getting a PhD you know, are thinking about this more from that perspective of, of research and top papers and or, or top universities and getting tenure at, you know, one of the, yeah. the, the big names and, and moving forward from there. But well, and, we don't and, know and that, just, right? And no. this is why applied behavioral science is so good because you're getting all these great, you know, researchers come because they, they're more PhDs are pursuing non-academic jobs because they have yes. the opportunity and, uh, and the the market within academia is just not there. So, and to some degree, I, I'm okay with this. So I uh, I disagree a bit with Merle's. I don't know her, not just her observation, but her conclusion that there's a certain pyramid scheme to this. Okay, because when I think about the effects of, for instance, uh, when I got my MBA, there were more law degree grads in the state of Minnesota where I got my MBA, then there were masters in business. Okay. And that seems really silly because only about 25% of those people were actually going to use those law degrees for going into the practice of the law. Yeah. And I'm okay with that as when we have more people in the business world that are educated about the law, that can, that can be helpful. So having more PhDs that don't go into the raw scholarship and research institutions can be good for our world overall in applying behavioral science in, especially in corporations that care about the scholarship. Well, I got my PhD with never the intention of <laughs> going yeah. into academia. That was never uh, part of my, my yeah. overall plan. I got a PhD yeah. because I wanted to get a PhD and, and to help, you know, educate me in this field that I found fascinating. And so that was never, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe and maybe in the back of my mind, retirement and being an adjunct professor um, and getting paid oh. nothing to to pay for my vacation every year. <laughs> that would be about it. To, you, you know, there you, you go. won't make enough to pay for your vacation every year. You said that there were two things that you wanted to gripe, uh, groove on. Uh, and the <laughs> was last the thing? thing. So when we asked Merle about the best interviews that she had. Yeah. Did you notice who she left out? <laughs> 
So both Tim and I have been interviewed by yeah. Merle for for her Money on the Mind thing, and neither of us were mentioned. And and um, you know, afterwards you she apologized a- for that off air, and she said, "I just couldn't." But we know, we know, blah, we were blah, blah, not blah. in the top. Blah, I get blah, blah, it. Blah, blah. I get yeah. it. <sighs> Jack and we gotta cuddling. work. We gotta work on our interviewing skills. We we are we we need to get better. Let's do. Let's yeah. up the game. I All think right. that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So that I think wraps up at least my key thoughts on our conversation. Yeah. Good enough. Good I mean, enough. Gosh, we could we could talk about Merle for ages because because <laughs> uh, she's just that outsized personality that she is. But for Groovers, I just want to remind them to you know. Leave us a review. Give us a rating. Tell a friend or a colleague. Just, you know, word of mouth can be totally underestimated and undervalued. And if you share, if you just tell a colleague or a friend uh, about behavioral grooves, it goes a long way in giving us a a chance to just get a little broader audience. And we hope that you take some of this money on the mind wisdom from Merle this week and use it to find your groove. Mm -hmm.